But in 2025, hastening Malaysia to become Asian economic powerhouse. I'm Melissa Vidani, I'm Brendan Lepal, and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. Budget 2025, worth 421 billion ringgit, remains strategically aligned with the Madani economy framework, focusing on attracting high quality investments, stimulating business opportunities, undertaking projects for the well being of the Rakyat, and not impacting the affordability in purchasing essential goods and services. Announcing the budget in Parliament today, Prime Minister Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim said the initiatives announced in the budget are designed to accelerate Malaysia's journey to become an economic powerhouse in Asia, positioning it for sustainable growth and resilience. Prestasi ekonomi mengatasi jangkaan dan unjuran, sama ada dari segi pertumbuhan, pelaburan dan nilai ringgit, menggambarkan keyakinan pelabur dan kejayaan awal dari langkah pembaharuan ekonomi madani. Dengan itu, KDNK 2024 diunjur lebih kukuh antara 4.8 hingga 5.3% ketimbang 4 ke 5% sebelumnya. Tahun depan, kita yakin ekonomi berkembang. Insya Allah kukuh antara 4.5 hingga 5.5%. Didukung langkah strategi belanjawan Madani ketiga 2025. On Melissa tonight, special edition on Budget 2025. Welcome back to the studio, Dr. Muhammad Afzanizam Abdul Rashid, Chief Economist at Bank Bomalat Malaysia Berhad. Sitting next to him, Mr. Harvinder Singh, Council Member at Chartered Tax Institute of Malaysia. Gentlemen. Welcome back to the program. Welcome back to the studio. It's lovely to have each and every one of you here today. Of course, an iconic day today, which is Budget 2025, table of the Prime Minister, Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Now, um, I'd like to get each of your reactions on budget that was tabled today early in Parliament. Uh, Dr. Afzanizam, let's start with you. Sure, I think um, the government is trying to be pragmatic in the approach. Uh, on one hand, uh, the government is remained committed to ensure that the budget gap will continue to be narrowed, which I think they are looking at 3.8% in terms of fiscal deficit target next year from an estimated 4.3% this year. And then uh, there's also the need to ensure that uh, the, the M40 and the B40 in terms of their purchasing power will continue to, continue to be looked at. And you can see that the allocations for Sumbanga to Narahma has been uh, raised to around 13 billion so on that note, I think it's, it's very pragmatic and I think quite cautious in their, um, uh, how they manage their fiscal deficit going, going forward. And Mr. Harvinder, what about you? <clears throat> well, uh, to echo what uh, Dr. Shad with us, uh, I think, you know, economically, I think we are a good place right now. Uh, the performance, the economic performance of the country has been, uh, I think, has exceeded, you know, certain expectations. And, uh, you know, Against uh, with this backdrop, uh, there are measures that have been put in to solidify the uh, and put more uh, disposable money or income into the pockets of uh, especially the low and middle income groups. And uh, the fact that uh, there is a huge uh, fund or budget that has been uh, earmarked for next year, I think the idea is obviously to also pump prime the economy and to get it to uh, move along and. Uh, be in a much, much better place uh, in 2025 and beyond. Right. So we've got a couple of questions with regards to the economy and also on taxation. Sure. And we'll get back to, to our guests right here in the studio. Now, moving forward, the Prime Minister also announced that the government plans to gradually expand the tax base by introducing a 2% tax on dividend income exceeding 100,000 ringgit for individual shareholders beginning the 2025 year of assessment. Ikhtiar ini dilaksanakan supaya cukai pendapatan dikutip tidak hanya bergantung pada sumbangan penerima gaji tetapi turut merangkumi sumbangan pemilik syarikat serta individu dengan milikkan harta saham jutaan ringgit. Pengecualian pendapatan dividen ini 
akan diberikan kepada simpanan kerajaan seperti KWSP, amanah saham di bawah PNB, pendapatan dividen daripada luar negara, itu akan dikecualikan. With what was discussed and what was shared by Prime Minister Dazasri Anwar Ibrahim, I have a two-part question here, if I may. Uh, there were some items mentioned on taxes, most notably the progressive broadening of the sales and service tax, which is SST scope, uh, which will be implemented effective uh, 1st of May. Now, uh, Mr. Havinder, can I get your comments on these? And secondly, we'll get to you, Dr. Afzal Nizam, as well. But Mr. Havinder, um, share with us. What do you make of this? Well, I think... Uh uh, firstly, there's an uh, uh, idea to sort of expand the scope to certain uh, items which perhaps are not uh, seen as essential. If we talk about the imported premium goods and Dr. I mean, uh, Dr. Sri Anwar mentioned uh, avocado and uh, salmon. Yes. Uh, I've got some friends that perhaps are pretty used to having that. Uh, they'll have to rethink that now. But uh, all other basic uh, essential items, the exemption will remain. And there's also an expansion of the uh, service tax to uh, new services such as commercial service transactions, including financial services you know, that are fee-based uh, for businesses. The uh, service tax uh, collection, I think, expected for 2024 is at about 41 billion, if I'm not mistaken. And I think with the measures already put in, uh, you know, where there's an ex uh, increase of 2% from 6%, which was implemented earlier this year, uh, once it's fully implemented next year, the uh, level of service tax collection is expected to be at about uh, perhaps about 47 billion. Right. So that would contribute somewhat to the coffers of the country as well. Right. Yeah. And this is actually a good approach. What do you think, Mr. Avinda? Well, I think uh, if you're maintaining the exemption on basic items and if there's affordability on the, the so-called premium items in terms of consumption, then I think that is perhaps uh, one of those uh, ways to have a little bit of an increase of taxes mm -hmm. without burdening the, uh, the, the people the, that are getting, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, what about you, Dr. Afzal Nizam? What would be the impact on household spending and also consumption? Well, I think um, the economy next year is expected to remain, uh, I would say, robust. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the labour markets, um, it will continue to remain in a full employment status. Right. That would mean we should we shall see the unemployment rates continue to, be, to remain low, and therefore that will provide uh, stability in terms of the spending among our consumers. So on that note, I think the government should be able to collect more taxes, mm -hmm. especially on consumption-related taxes. Mm -hmm. So that actually resonates well with their strategy to make sure that the uh, the fiscal deficit could be uh, narrowed further uh, next year. Mm -hmm. I think they are looking at around 80 billion deficits next year, which is equivalent to 3.8% uh, of GDP. Mm -hmm. So if they can do that, I think from the credit rating agency's point of view, the likes of uh, S&P, mm -hmm. the likes of Moody's and Fish Rating, is going to be a credit positive assessment. Mm -hmm. So I think if they can show this, uh, perhaps we shall see perhaps you know in terms of uh, a review in the rating outlook which can be you know good for our ringgit perhaps and there could be more inflows of funds coming to our Malaysian markets. Mm -hmm. Dr. Afzal, uh, you mentioned that of course if this is uh, uh, feasible in a sense that if it can be done whatever that was discussed today in your own opinion mm -hmm. do you think we will approach to this green path f next year? Well I think um, on one hand, you see there's a measures to increase taxes. Yeah. You know, these measures will have an impact in terms of the, uh, the purchasing power among our societies. But at the same time, there are also m mitigation plans right. being put in place. Right. Yeah? Uh, I think mentioned about the higher allocations for, um, you know, uh, the Subangan to Rama and Subangan Asas Rama uh, to around 13 billion. So uh, I think this measures will actually be able to mitigate the impact and therefore it could smoothen the the impact to the GDP growth. That's, I think, the, among the reason why I think the government is looking at a, a range forecast of 4.5% to 5% for 2025. Right. 
And speaking of all this, uh, of course, it highlights allocation. And uh, we're going to be talking about this allocation because right now we're going to move forward to subsidies. Because the Premier also noted that the government needs to accept the bold approach of targeting subsidies so that they are no longer spent in bulk. Now, he said this move has resulted in significant savings that can be used for other important matters. Dato Sri Anwar said the undeniable reality is that foreign citizens and the top 15% of ultra-wealthy users are benefiting from 40% of the 8 billion ringgit subsidy on RON95 petrol. However, the Premier noted that the government is committed to maintaining subsidies for the majority of the population as seen in the targeted electricity subsidies where 85% of the people are not affected. Kerajaan akan hanya dan dari oleh itu untuk 85% kerajaan terpaksa menanggung subsidi di anggar berjumlah 12 bilion ringgit untuk 85%. Dari 8 bilion ringgit yang boleh diselamatkan itu adalah dari golongan maha kaya dan warga asing. Dan saya harap di Dewan ini tidak ada yang mewakili maha kaya dan warga asing. Kerajaan bercadang untuk melaksanakan penyara subsidi RON95 pada pertengahan tahun 2025. Penyempatan, saya tegaskan, penjimatan ini akan menjamin faedah di bidang pendidikan, kesihatan dan kebajikan rakyat. Now let's touch a bit on Raw 95 because I think this is everybody's favourite topic. When the budget is stable, they'll be wondering, oh wow, will there be a reduction or more subsidies to enjoy? Now the PM as well noted that the government plans to implement targeted subsidies for Raw 95 petrol in mid-2025 next year, of course. Dr. Afzan Nizam, your thoughts on this? May next year, isn't that a little bit too late if, it's, if I may actually say that? Right. I think the government is mindful about the impact. If you look at their uh, inflation forecast for next year, they are looking at uh, 2.5, sorry, 2 percent to 3.5 percent in terms of inflation targets for next year. From this year, estimated at around 1.5 percent to 2 percent. So that's quite a big jump. So perhaps that could actually to account the possible impact of the uh, possible rise in fuel prices. And we know that the consumptions of RON95 vis-a-vis -vis diesel, mm -hmm. of course, we use a lot of RON95. Yeah. So we shall expect a, quite a significant impact to inflation. So I think the government needs to manage that. I think for this budget, what they do, they'll do is actually to manage the timeline. Mm -hmm. So actually to indicate what's the plan, what's the timeline, and perhaps going forward, there will be more uh, details on it. I think they did the same thing for diesel. Yeah? Right. Budget 2024, they mentioned about diesel. And in June, 10 of June, they they rolled out the plan. Rolled out the plan. So yeah. I think it's the same MO mm -hmm. for 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 Ron 95. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Abzanizam. And now, of course, we'd like to touch base on the education sector. Uh, the Ministry of Education has been allocated 64.1 billion ringgit. Now, this is, of course, the highest allocation in history. Now, uh, this entails the government's priority in ensuring a comfortable, safe, and meaningful learning environment for children. 2 bilion ringgit untuk naik taraf dan penyelenggaraan sekolah seluruh negara. 1 bilion ringgit menyelenggara semua jenis sekolah terutama keadaan bilik darjah yang uzur. Ini termasuk sekolah kebangsaan, sekolah Cina, sekolah Tamil, sekolah agama, sekolah dalam kem tentera dan sekolah pendidikan khas OKU. 1 bilion prasarana naif di 5, 4, 3 sekolah terutama di Sabah dan Sarawak. The Prime Minister added a total of 44 new schools will begin construction next year. More with our guests soon. But let's move on with the responsibility of leaders and also the government. And of course, it was revealed in Tiburkuril is to build a nation that is not only committed to uplifting the dignity of the lives of the poor, and destitute, but also to eradicate the plague of diseases and destructive enemies. Dr. Sri Anwar said post-normal life requires a more complex healthcare system and a solid integration of public and private health sectors in line with the consideration outlined in the National Health White Paper. Kementerian Kesihatan menerima peruntukan kedua tertinggi 45.3 bilion ringgit. 
Jadi saya telah mengarahkan supaya Kementerian Kesihatan, Kementerian Pendidikan dan Kementerian-Kementerian terkait beri sedikit lebih tumpuan kepada perasaan asas. Kerana kemudahan-kemudahan hospital di lobi, tandas lobi hospital tu banyak yang taif. Gunakan peruntukan ini dan pastikan diperbaiki. The Premier also said that the government is also continuing to upgrade the run-down clinics across the country. Under the Madani government, the budget for this purpose is increased every year with 150 million ringgit for 2024 and 300 million ringgit for the following year. A few moments ago, with regards to today's tabling of the budget, the government has agreed to raise the minimum wage from 1,500 ringgit per month to 1,700 ringgit per month, effective 1st February next year. Penangguhan hanya diberikan membabitkan majikan yang mempunyai kurang daripada lima pekerja bagi tempoh enam bulan, iaitu berkuat kuasa 1 Ogos 2025. Kesuma juga akan menerbitkan garis panduan untuk rujukan pekerja. Dasar gaji progresif ini ikhtiar kerajaan untuk mereformasi pasaran boroh. Matlamat meningkatkan pendapatan pekerja. Dasar ini mula digunakan, dilaksanakan secara rintis pada Jun lalu dan akan dikuatkuasakan sepenuhnya pada tahun depan. Dasar gaji progresif diperuntukkan 200 juta ringgit dan akan memanfaatkan 50 ribu pekerja. Coming back to our guests, now, uh, minimum wage increase from 1,500 ringgit per month to 1,700 ringgit per month. Uh, we're talking about an increase of 200 ringgit right here. Uh, we're going to get both of your response, whether our private sector could actually abide to it. Uh, Mr. Havinder, can we hear your take first? Uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, well, I think uh, when it was uh, implemented at 1,500 ringgit uh, per month, uh, there were challenges faced by a lot of businesses, uh, especially post-pandemic, you know, with the rising cost of doing business. Uh, it became an added burden to the, uh, obviously, to the cost of doing business. So uh, if there's going to be an increase, uh, although it's not very much, mm -hmm. ringgit, it would certainly add on to that uh, cost of doing business. But... It is something that perhaps needs to be done and gradually we've got to look at uh, increasing the level of uh, wages as well. If I may just add on a couple of other observations that I have. Uh, I think uh, you know, part of the issue we have is that over the years the Malaysian economy has become very domesticated. And uh, we need to start looking at how to you know, be an exporting country. And in today's budget, I think the focus was on the electronics and electrical sector. Yeah which uh, has seen an exponential growth you know, in the, over the years and all that. So Malaysia wants to be a big participant in this. A lot of measures and a lot of, I think, uh, efforts are being put in. So we need to look at uh, expanding our businesses and trying to go up to, the, uh, to countries uh, where there is uh, greater purchasing power. So since we have become uh, rather domesticated and uh, the affordability levels are perhaps uh, subdued, uh, that obviously has an impact on the revenues that are earned and how much you can afford to pay as far as wages go. And uh, one other interesting point, I think, uh, based on a PMX uh, announcement a couple of days ago, that uh, if you talk about increasing revenue through consumption taxes and GST in particular, mm -hmm. it will only come into play once the minimum wage has uh, hit the 3,000 level. So this also appears to be perhaps... Uh, you know, part of the plan or part of the process to eventually get there, maybe in the next three or four years, mm -hmm. perhaps. Right. Um, perhaps maybe what's highlighted here is about the ripple effect. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned, just probably 200 ringgit, it's maybe not that much, but could create a positive impact one way or another. Uh, and of course, Mr. Dr. Abzan Nizam, yeah. would you like to comment further on that? Well, I think minim minimum wage essentially is a form of uh, active labour market policies because there's es essentially the, the, the labour market is inefficient to determine the, the, the wage level. So the government come in and intervene. Mm -hmm. So by setting the minimum wage is one of the means to ensure that the, 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 the wage level are more equitable in that sense. 
uh, but as Harvey said, it has some ripple effect in terms of cost of doing business. So this is where uh, I think the government is again being mindful. So I think they have given certain form of uh, exemptions, uh, temporary exemptions for uh, small businesses. Uh, I think they allowed some 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 time frame for them to adhere this new which uh, minimum wage level. So I think essentially, yeah, I think it is it's about uh, uh, the government is trying to intervene, whereby uh, the the labour market is inefficient. Yeah. Right. And what about the private sector when they hear this and um, getting them to actually increase? these wages, uh, would you think that would create a negative impact with regards to their sustainability, perhaps? Minimum wage has always been uh, uh, unpopular always been among the employers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always a point of contention among them. So I think perhaps there will be more dialogues going forward between the government and the employers. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Nizam. Uh, now, the Prime Minister noted that a total of 200 million ringgit will be allocated covering the Strategic Co-Investment Fund and the National Industry Development Fund next year. Now, this is, of course, to support the growth of SMEs and mid-sized companies as well as to encourage entrepreneurship. Government-linked investment companies through Gear Up Initiative will increase direct investments in the country amounting to 120 billion ringgit over a period of five years, with 25 billion ringgit to be invested next year. Umpamanya, kuap. Melalui dana pemacu 6 billion ringgit memperkukuh pasaran persendirian tempatan melalui equity persendirian prasarana dan hartana. Pelabuhan ini untuk merangsang pertumbuhan pengurusan dana tempatan. Uh, kerjasama co-GP dengan 500 juta ringgit mulai dilaporkan tahun depan melibut, melibatkan 8 sektor termasuk pusat data, peralihan tenaga dan perbuatan canggih. The Premier also revealed Kazana will provide 1 billion ringgit to steer in investments that support the local semiconductor industry. Malaysia's ASEAN Chairmanship in 2025 is the best opportunity to steer ASEAN guided by the ASEAN Community Vision 2045. Dr. Sri Anwar said Malaysia is committed to charting a more resilient, innovative and people-centric direction for ASEAN. Elaborating further, the Premier said Malaysia firmly adheres to a collective approach in crafting a reform agenda at the ASEAN level, including promoting development in border areas with neighbouring countries. Penambahan keyakinan kepada Malaysia yang julung kalinya berlaku di ASEAN, iaitu mengadakan sidang kemuncak ASEAN, negeri Arab GCC dan negara China buat julung kalinya. Dr. Sri Anwar further noted that the ASEAN Malaysia Chairmanship next year will involve hosting over 270 meetings and activities across all states. He also expressed hope the hosting will generate income for entrepreneurs, especially in logistics services, hospitality and tourism, among others. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but um, I need to get Mr. Harvinder's input. Uh, coming back to taxation and the collection as well. Now, the Prime Minister mentioned that Malaysia's tax collection to GDP ratio is the lowest in the region. Uh, do you think the measures that have been introduced will actually help improve tax collection in Malaysia? Well, Brendan, actually, uh, the plan to sort of uh, increase the collection ratio, the tax to GDP collection ratio, uh, as it stands, we are one of the lowest in the region, and uh, the recommended rate of uh, the, the recommended ratio is actually at about 30 over percent by the OECD. We had about 12, and that's a long way to go. <clears throat> but uh, the measures that have already been introduced over the last few years, uh, notably, I think uh, we talked about invoicing. And the invoicing is now actually implemented. Uh, it's going to be implemented in stages by July 2025. Yep. And in, in the budget announced today, there are also some measures to try to allow for a quicker claim of uh, you know the benefits of whatever you incur. Instead of claiming over three years, you can claim over two years, your IT systems, etc. So I think the main uh, 
main uh, component or main factor that will help to, uh, you know, basically uh, increase this uh, tax collection uh, ratio mm -hmm. uh, is probably the invoicing uh, system. It is expected to bring on board a lot of uh, businesses that perhaps are not uh, on the system yet and not paying taxes accordingly. Right. That's one, and uh, I suppose which is why in terms of uh, the introduction of GST, it is not something that is, uh, that, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, urgent at this point in time, mm -hmm. because once invoicing is implemented uh, you know, in full, I think it will uh, have a very positive impact. Right, so it co sort of contradicts. Does it work that way uh, with e-invoicing and also uh, GST or SSC that will be implemented? Does it? No, no, it doesn't. Actually, the whole idea of the invoicing system is to basically ensure that every transaction that's carried out uh, is essentially uh, under the purview or the tax authorities are privy to it. And uh, so the relevant parties will pay the taxes accordingly. And in fact, uh, as far as I know it, the invoicing system uh, has been designed in such a way that it can accommodate uh, GST as well. Right. The GST implementation eventually as well, if that is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be very complementary. Uh, uh, it's going to be a huge year for all of us uh, indeed, when indeed. it comes to 2025. And uh, Dr. Afzal Nizab, uh, coming back to you, <laughs> before we go, if there's a, an implementation for budget 2025 next year that actually really st sort of like stood out for you, what would it be? I'll, I must say the subsidy rationalizations, the RON 95. Um, to me, I think the impact is quite significant. If you look at the uh, share of uh, RON 95 in our consumer price index, it account about 5% of total CPI as opposed to 0.2% for diesel. Mm -hmm. So based on the weight in the CPI, you can imagine the impact to uh, inflation to Malaysia once this rationalisation of Ron 95 subsidies will, will to happen next year. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Afsan Nizam, for being here with us today. And also, uh, Mr. Havinder, for being here with us today, for sharing your inputs and also your insights. And if you'd like to watch the repeat of this particular episode, you're more than welcome to check out RTM Click. All the other episodes is there. And of course, this special edition of Melissa Tonight, which we highlighted Budget 2025 and more, will be able to be streamed on that platform as well. That's it from us this evening. In our top story, Budget 2025, hastening Malaysia to, became, to become Asian economic powerhouse. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you for watching. Take care and have a fantastic weekend.